The year is 1986. Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi has drawn what he calls the Line of Death, a territorial boundary he swore would be the last thing any intruding aircraft would ever cross. The US and most other countries say the Gulf is international water and that everyone has a right to sail there. And Libya purchased advanced S-200 missile defense systems from the Soviet Union to enforce this line. On April 15th of that year, the crew of an SR-71 Blackbird was sent to test that claim, thundering past his line at 2,125 miles per hour. What followed was perhaps the most audacious game of chicken ever played. Libyan missile sites lit up their radar and began launching surface-to-air missiles one after the other, but the Blackbird pilots didn't turn back. They didn't dive for cover, they didn't deploy countermeasures, instead they did something that would be extremely stupid in any other aircraft. They pushed the throttles forward and kept going, accelerating past its official top speed of Mach 3.3, then 3.4, then 3.5, each mile covered in just 1.6 seconds. Gaddafi's line of death became just another boundary the SR-71 left in its sonic wake, along with the missiles that were supposed to enforce it. This is the story of the SR-71 Blackbird. Over 4,000 missiles were fired at the Blackbird with not one managing to touch it. But to get to this point, engineers had to achieve the impossible by designing the single fastest and highest flying thing in the world. This is an actual speeding bullet, a 45 caliber round ripping through the air at roughly 830 feet per second. But it could never dream of catching the Blackbird with a top speed over 3400 feet per second, three and a half times the speed of sound. As one pilot said, I can't tell you how fast it goes, but I can tell you I've seen the sun rise from the west. And it reached these incredible speeds at an equally unbelievable height, flying more than 16 miles above the surface of the earth. The Blackbird immediately set records that are still unbroken to this day. But to understand why this insane machine was created, we need to go back to the height of the Cold War. The United States and the Soviet Union are locked in a tense standoff. Each superpower is desperate to know what the other is up to and satellite technology is still in its infancy. It's May 1st, 1960. An American U-2 spy plane piloted by Gary Powers is cruising at 70,000 feet over Russia. The U-2 is the backbone of US intelligence and the Americans are confident. They've been running these missions for years, photographing secret Soviet military installations from an altitude that their weapons simply couldn't reach. But on this day, everything changed. The Soviets had secretly developed a new surface-to-air missile, the SA-2. As powers flew directly over Russia, a barrage of these missiles streaked towards his aircraft. The first two fell short, but the third missile hit its mark. As the U-2 careened out of the sky, Powers was able to eject, quickly being captured by the Soviets. Just like that, America was left in the dark. The U-2 program had been remarkable. Its cameras could read a newspaper headline from 13 miles up. But that was all suddenly obsolete now that Soviet missiles had caught up. This was a crucible in which the SR-71 was born. It wasn't enough to simply build a better spy plane. America needed something that could restore their ability to gather intelligence while being completely immune to the threats that had brought down the U-2. They needed raw speed. Lockheed's legendary Skunk Works team had already been working on a solution through the A-12 program that would eventually transform into the SR-71 Blackbird. Not only would it be able to fly higher than the U-2, but also fly more than three times faster than any other aircraft in existence. But now, it needed to be ready as soon as possible. This all fell on the shoulders of Chief Engineer Clarence Kelly Johnson and his team. They were given an almost impossible task. Create an aircraft that could fly at over three times the speed of sound at the edge of space with reduced visibility to radar. Nothing like this had ever been done before. 
and nearly every single component of the plane would have to be reinvented from the ground up. But US defense spending in the early 60s hovered around 9% of GDP, compared to around 3.5% in modern times. So they could pretty much just throw money at each problem until it was solved. The most obvious challenge from day one had to do with materials. No matter how aerodynamic their design was, flying at Mach 3.5 was going to produce a lot of heat, and traditional materials like aluminum were simply not going to hold up. There really was only one suitable material, titanium. And that was going to be a problem. 92% of each aircraft needed to be made from titanium. The United States, for all its industrial might, didn't have nearly enough titanium to build these planes. Only one country did, and it happened to be the very country that this plane was being built to spy on. The Soviet Union had the largest deposits of titanium ore in the world, and come hell or high water, the US was going to get their hands on it. So the CIA began to orchestrate one of the most audacious procurement operations in history. While we don't know the exact details, we do know the CIA began creating a network of shell companies and third-party buyers located in various neutral and third world countries. Each one had a completely plausible cover story posing as civilian aerospace or manufacturing firms requiring titanium for commercial purposes. One of them was a fake company claiming to make titanium pizza ovens. And ultimately, this worked. But even with their hands on the material, they weren't much closer to having a flyable plane. Titanium wasn't just rare, it was practically impossible to work with. This had never been done before, and every step of the manufacturing process had to be invented from scratch. Titanium made construction possible, but it alone still couldn't resist the extreme temperatures. At full speed, the Blackbird would travel nearly 39 miles every single minute. Cutting through the air at this rate meant that the exterior titanium still needed to be cooled in some way. The obvious solution was to pump fuel throughout the body to provide cooling. By weight, the Blackbird was 57% fuel. There was tons of it ready to absorb a lot of heat. There was just one problem. Normal jet fuel would simply break down at these temperatures, literally decomposing into something resembling tar in the fuel lines. The SR-71 needed something entirely new, something that could not only power the engines, but also serve as a heatsink for the entire aircraft without breaking down. The result was JP-7, a fuel so unique it was developed specifically for the Blackbird. But this new fuel created another problem, and this trend of each solution leading to a brand new problem would remain a theme throughout the Blackbird's development. Now the problem was that JP-7 was so chemically stable that you could literally throw a lit match into a puddle of it and the match would go out. Great for handling extreme temperatures, not so great when you actually need to ignite it in the engines. The solution was something called triethyl borane, or TEB, a chemical that ignites the moment it contacts air. Each engine start required a precise shot of TEB to ignite the JP-7, and pilots had a limited number of these shots available. Run out of TEB and your engine simply won't start again until ground crews can replenish it. Then there was the matter of keeping this exotic fuel inside the plane, which as it turned out, they couldn't. The Blackbird was built to operate at such extreme temperatures that the airframe would expand by several inches in flight. Making the fuel tank seal perfectly on the ground would mean they'd rupture when the plane heated up and expanded. This meant that the SR-71 had to be refueled immediately after takeoff and often several times during a mission they couldn't just use any tanker aircraft. The KC-135Q tankers had to be specially modified to carry the unique JP-7 fuel. No other aircraft in the inventory used it. These dedicated tankers became an essential part of every mission, positioned strategically along the route like pit stops in a race. But even with a special fleet of tankers, aerial refueling presented its own set of challenges. 
the SR-71 was most efficient at high altitudes and speeds where no tanker could reach. Finding an altitude and speed where both aircraft could operate safely was like trying to choreograph a dance between a cheetah and a tortoise. They eventually settled on refueling at around 25,000 feet, well below the SR-71's optimal altitude, in what pilots called the painful part of its flight envelope. But when the Blackbird was at its optimal altitude, it was an experience like no other. At more than 80,000 feet, SR-71 pilots didn't just fly above other aircraft, they flew above 95% of Earth's atmosphere. Up there, the sky transforms from blue to an increasingly dark purple until it fades to black overhead. You can see the curvature of the Earth stretching out below while solar radiation levels are so high that pilots could sometimes see cosmic rays with their eyes closed. At these altitudes, a normal flight suit would be useless. SR-71 pilots wore pressure suits nearly identical to what astronauts used. Navigation at over Mach 3 presented its own unique challenges. At these speeds, conventional maps become almost useless. By the time you find your position, you're already 40 miles from where you started looking. The solution was an automated celestial navigation system that could track stars even in broad daylight. This aircraft navigated more like a ship in space rather than a plane in the atmosphere. But perhaps the most remarkable feature of the SR-71 was its engines. The Pratt & Whitney J-58s were so revolutionary that they basically transformed during flight. At top speed, only 20% of the thrust was coming from the traditional jet engine. The other 80% was effectively a ramjet. Using the specially designed inlet cones to create thrust from the shock waves of the compressed air itself. Those distinctive cones in the engine inlets, which could move back and forth by up to 26 inches, weren't just for show. They were precisely controlling the shock waves created by flying at over Mach 3, positioning them exactly where they needed to be to compress the air entering the engines. Get it wrong and the shock wave could move out of position, causing the inlet to unstart, a violent event that could force the nose of the aircraft to pitch up unexpectedly. But when everything was working correctly, something almost magical happened. The faster the aircraft flew, the more efficient it became. The SR-71 actually burned less fuel at Mach 3 with the afterburners on than it did at lower speeds with them off. It was an aircraft that seemed to defy conventional wisdom. The harder you pushed it, the better it performed. The Blackbird wasn't just designed to fly at these extreme speeds. It was most at home there, where the physics that constrained other aircraft began to work in its favor. The SR-71 speed wasn't its only defense against enemy missiles. Despite being nearly 75% longer than a modern F-15 Eagle, the Blackbird had a radar cross-section significantly smaller. This wasn't an accident. Features that would later become standard in stealth aircraft were pioneered on the SR-71. The aircraft's distinctive chines, those sharp edge extensions running along its body, were designed to reflect radar waves away from enemy receivers. The dark black paint contained iron ferrite particles that absorbed radar energy. Even the vertical tails were tilted inward to reduce radar reflections, a feature common on modern stealth planes. While it was not stealthy by modern standards, these features did mean enemy radar usually couldn't get a lock until the aircraft was relatively close, and by then, it was already pulling away at over Mach 3. It's amazing that all of this could be accomplished in the early 1960s, before homes had microwave ovens or even smoke detectors. This combination of speed and low observability meant that despite flying over 4,000 missions, including countless flights over heavily defended territory, not a single SR-71 was ever hit by enemy fire. But in the end, what finally brought down the SR-71 wasn't missiles, it was bureaucracy and changing technology. By the late 1980s, satellite technology had advanced significantly. While satellites couldn't match the SR-71's flexibility or provide the psychological impact of flying over enemy territory, they could provide consistent reconnaissance without the enormous operational costs of the Blackbird program. 
the SR-71's final years were marked by a series of spectacular flights that seemed designed to remind the world what was being lost. In 1990, on its retirement flight from California to Washington, D.C., it set a speed record of 64 minutes and 20 seconds, a record that still stands today. The Blackbird didn't just retire, it flew straight into the Smithsonian, a fitting end for an aircraft that had pushed the boundaries of what was possible in aerospace engineering. Even today, more than 30 years after its retirement, no air-breathing aircraft has matched its combination of speed, altitude, and capability. In an era of stealth aircraft and hypersonic missiles, the SR-71 remains a testament to what can be achieved when engineering genius meets unlimited ambition, and a reminder that sometimes the best solution to a complex problem is simply to go faster than anyone thought possible.